We're going to have one more within this series, so please welcome with me um, Dr. Erica Walker, um, an environmental exposure scientist coming here with her crutches. I'm so amazed to see um, another lady coming up on stage while having crutches. I just had an ACL and meniscus tear beginning of the year, and I know how it is, and I love strong females who make it happen no matter what, coming up with their crutches. So give a big round of applause to hear about data-driven community empowerment. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as you can see, I've torn my ACL, PCL, MCL, meniscus tear. <laughs> so it's, I'm, a, I'm in a lot of pain. <laughs> yeah, I got, got it all done at once. Um, so it's, my name's Erica. I'm an exposure scientist, and I'm also an environmental epidemiologist. Um, I went to the Harvard Chan School for Public Health where I did my um, doctorate in environmental health. Um, if you would have told me that I would have been here in the Hub Week talking about uh, community noise, which is my area of interest, I wouldn't have believed you. Like 12 years ago, I'd been like, wouldn't have happened. Um, but before that, 12 years ago, I was actually a working artist. I worked in my apartment. I made furniture, and I also did bookbinding. Um, so you can see some of my work there. When that was what I thought I was going to do. I was really planning to become a full-time, full-fledged artist. However, I lived in a basement apartment, and in the moved above me was a family with two small, non-school-aged non kids who moved in. And of course, <laughs> they ran all day. It would seem like 24 hours a day. So they ran across their floor, which was my ceiling, my workspace, and it really drove me crazy. So I went to trusty Google to figure out how I'm going to deal with this situation, how am I going to solve this problem. And with um, looking at Google and trying to find some solutions to this noise issue that I was now faced with, um, I saw a couple of temporary solutions like using your broomstick to bang on the ceiling or, or calling the police. I've done both. Um, but I was sort of kind of struck by, I wasn't the only one suffering from this situation, and this problem was a lot larger than myself. And I'm just going to share with you some results from a, the Greater Boston Neighborhood Noise Report that I released in 2016, just to kind of give you a little bit of insight into what people are dealing with when it comes to community noise issues. Um, a lot of people feel that it's unwanted, they can't control it, if they complain about it, nothing's going to be done among other things. And for me, the most important part was both, you know, because I went through it and these were the experiences of others, that it felt, they felt like it's impacting their health. So, you know, there is no happy ending with, this, with my story. I ended up having to move. And, um, but in the same process I enrolled into public health school, one of my mentors said, you know, Erica, I think that you'd be interested in something called public health. Never heard of it, never crossed my mind, um, but I decided to enroll in public health school because I really wanted to get down to the bottom of how this was impacting people's health. But here's the thing. When you enter into academia, as I call the ivory tower industrial complex, you have to make a decision. You have to figure out whether or not you're going to be a traditional academic or you're going to be one that actually brings about some sort of positive change. So for me, I wanted to be a public health practitioner and not just a academic who published papers. So that meant that I knew that when I enrolled into public health school, I was gonna have to do a little soul searching. And I was kind of surprised that I was gonna have to rely on my training as an artist. That meant that I was gonna be, have to be creative and try to come up with creative solutions to, to, um, to rectify the situation. So instead of being a traditional academic, I decided that I was going to be a, um, I was going to conduct ride-sharing science. And let me tell you what I mean about ride-sharing science. It's sort of like traditional science where you start with an hypothesis. But at the same time, I like to call my hypotheses uh, a, a destination. And it's a destination because it's a place that I want to get to. But with ride-sharing science, your destination, you, as you're going to your destination, you pick up people along the way and you listen to their input. And your hypotheses, you should be open to them changing. So for example, when I started public health school, I was very interested in understanding how things like road traffic noise or aircraft noise impacted our health. But as I began to um, talk about, talk to other people, 
you know, I began to, to figure out that this was a lot more complex and I needed to take a step back and, and listen. So my destination was I wanted to understand the relationship between community noise and health but I was very open and willing to pick up passengers along to way, the way to help me to understand what that actually meant. So for example, this is Andrea, she lives in the North End, and she says that I'm sensitive to noise and I feel like it impacts me more. Well, that wasn't something I was considering when I originally started my research. I was only worried about how loud the sounds were. And then I talked to other people along the way and they shared their stories with me that I feel helped me to develop a more rich um, study project. So if you look at this map right here, you'll see that on your left, on your far left here, you'll see that these are actual sound levels in the city of Boston. And then you see here, if you can pay attention to East Boston up at the top, we see that East Boston is not that much louder than other parts of the city. But if you look on your right here, the right just is a way that people have rated the loudness of their neighborhood, East Boston, people in East Boston feel like their neighborhood is really loud. And for me, I'm interested in is that perception also or additionally impacting our health? So with that research, I was able to develop Noise Score, which is a smartphone application that allows individuals to describe their noise climate, both objectively and subjectively. Objectively by measuring the actual decibel level, but then subjectively by talking about how it makes them feel along many domains. And that data is uploaded in real time. If this is a live sound map and it's updated every one minute. So eight people are able to gauge the noise climate in their communities along many domains. So in addition to that, okay, you develop an app, so what? A lot of people have apps, but how can we use these apps to, to bring about change? Well, I was talking to Mary Han. She's uh, the director of Mission Hill, Ma Health, oh, sorry, sorry, Mission Hill Health Movement, and she was like, well, we're interested in understanding the soundscape perception in extremes, really young people, really old people. How does that look? So we're now currently using this app to understand, to understand the soundscape with really old people and really young people. And then also in the community in the Fenway, we're using the app to advocate for fewer concerts in the summer so we are um, crowdsourcing data. People are using the app to measure sounds before, during, and after concerts, and we're hoping to bring this data to the next licensing board hearing to reduce the number of concerts. So those are some of the successes, but I'm not gonna lie to you, everything's not easy. Um, so some of the failures. So we developed a neighborhood noise report card, and this was a disaster. As a matter of fact, I went to a concert and someone came up to me and cursed me out and was like, well, I live in this neighborhood and it's not that quiet, so I don't know what you're talking about. You didn't poll me. So I feel like some of those comments, whether they're harsh or not, they serve to inform and um, improve upon the research. And I think that's the benefits of ride-sharing science. So. In summary, I think that community noise issues are a great way for us to get it right when it comes to engaging the communities in academic research. Thank you. Thank you so much for making it all the way up here and sharing your story and inspiring others. One more round of applause, actually. Thank you so much again. All right, everyone, so um, I hope that you are all as inspired by this morning's session as we were. Um, and now it is time for lunch, okay? So yes to lunch. And so just to note as well, um, all of, most of the speakers uh, from, from earlier today are around as well. So please take this opportunity to engage with the speakers if you have additional questions. Um, we had one note about uh, Dr. Helen Reese, who has a book coming out in November called The Empathy Effect. So, so if you're still thinking about dinosaurs and wanting to look people into the eye, yes. you should definitely get your hands on that book. Exactly. And so uh, the only other bit of housekeeping is to come back here at 1.30 p.m. Again, please be prompt. Come back at 1.30. We've got, again, another packed uh, afternoon of talks and activities for you all. And yeah, Sandra, am I Are you all anything? excited? Are you all feeling Woo! good? Yes? Yes. Okay. So be back here at 1.30, and uh, please go enjoy lunch and being with each other. Thank you all again. Make See you friends. All. Yes.